I just have to start off with the fact that the card I pulled was Conversations with Cynics. So I thought that was rather appropriate. Um, so Julie, thank you so much for your time. And let's start, you started the Halter Project in 2013. What sparked that? I was looking around me and I knew having been um, within just about a mile of the epicenter of the Loma Prieta quake in 1989. I'm totally uh, dating myself now, I know this. Um, and I, I grew up in the Central Valley in the Foothill area. You know, I grew up in a culture of it's gonna burn every summer and we're gonna sit here in our backyards and you know, watch lightning in the, in the foothills and this, it's gonna be smoky and we're gonna see glowing and you know, Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent fires. And I was looking around where I lived. Jen just you know, gave a good description of what it was like after. But um, I do live at the foot of the Mayakama Mountains. I've lived here for a very long time. I was looking around and seeing it be drier and drier and drier. Uh, and they kept telling us every year, you know, in, within 30 years, we're going to have another big one. And we don't know when that 30 years started. So basically, I knew that something was going to happen. And I worry about the animals. I worried about my animals. And I worried about everyone else's animals. It was very, very difficult in our area and indeed much of, uh, much of the state and some of the country to find out what to do to keep our animals safe, to be prepared, where to go, what to pack, what's a ready kit for your pet or your horse or your donkey or your iguana look like. And uh, fortunately for me, I knew a bunch of people from around the country and around the world who were already either experts in this subject or they were becoming leaders in their communities or their states or their countries and they basically kicked me in the butt and said, you can do this, your state needs you, your town needs you, your community needs you, we will help you. And I just, a little aside, uh, as I've been sitting here today watching and listening and I'm just really excited to be here and, uh, and inspired, and I was here last year, some of my strongest, most stalwart mentors were from the state of Colorado, and they're still behind me today, and also the beautiful country of New Zealand. And my friend Haley Squantz was plucked from her bed in the middle of the night to lead New Zealand's response for caring for animals after the Christchurch earthquake. And these are just a handful among uh, two hands full of incredible people who have led the way for others and are still working today. And they helped me start my program, which, as you said, was in 2013, long before anything really big had happened in my neighborhood or to me. So the underlying thread for today, it's kind of stitching everything together, is preparedness and knowing when to go. And that, you keep saying, is your common denominator. Could you explain to everybody what you see as the common denominator with getting animals out, getting yourself out? We talked about this a little bit. And again, uh, stitching all of the parts together today is about um, resourcing, networking, connecting, and um, finding those common denominators. When it comes to keeping our animals safe during and after an emergency or disaster, the single strongest, the single most common, common denominator, I think, is knowing when to go. You know, we started out by saying, well, it's the common denominator in all these disasters about all the animals that uh, needed help and, and all of the hysteria and the trauma and the angst that's taking place around the animals is because people waited too long to evacuate. It's not that simple. It's developing and helping our communities, our neighbors, all of the people that we are here to try to help strengthen, it's helping our communities and ourselves be more situationally aware. And when I give presentations, which I do many times each week and each month, I often tell people, when you're thinking about emergency and disaster preparedness, and you're an animal owner, and that's usually my audience, 
you want to think like the animals do. They are so hyper situationally aware. And that's what we need to be thinking about, and that's what we need to be sharing, and that's what we need to develop as a culture of readiness among all of our residents and particularly the animal owners. In, in the preparation theme, a lot of people, when they have their own animals or if they have livestock, they won't have room for that when they're evacuating. So what is, what's some advice to prepare for that? Well, animals include livestock. <laughs> that is true. I'm talking like, you know, Fido. Right, and right, right. right. <laughs> oh, and just to clarify that, um, some of you who live here always associate me with, you know, oh, the horse lady. She rescues horses in disasters. And I have been a horsewoman all my life. But our program is dedicated to keeping all animals safe in every type of incident. So it's your pets, your equines, your backyard livestock, your chickens, and also the commercial production livestock. So you're talking about evacuation and often you're not going to be able to evacuate your animals. And we know this and it is a source of enormous anxiety and stress for people. So the message that we put out there is really simple and it's really clear and the solutions are all around us and many of you in the room are the creators and the messengers for a lot of these solutions but it's simply this know when to go if you're going to evacuate if that's your plan a do it far in advance of when somebody tells you you have to go because it's going to take longer just as it will if you just had your knee replaced or your husband had his knee replaced or you've got the grandchildren in tow. Animals are gonna slow you down and they're not always going to be cooperative. So if your primary plan, if your plan A is evacuate, and I'm not saying this necessarily to all of you for yourselves, although, you know, practice what you preach, right? If you're not safe, you can't keep the animals safe. And yes, guilty, I say that all the time. Um, the oxygen mask speech applies. But it's, it's about being aware of what the weather is doing. What's going on? What are the conditions? Uh, what stage of weather watch or warning or other type of alert are we at? And it applies to all of the natural, um, the, the, the weather, weather conditions that lead to natural disasters. And if you cannot evacuate for whatever reason, or your plan is to not evacuate your animals, this is the solution. And it applies to people as well as animals. If our homes are safe, our animals will be safer. And both we and our animals will have homes to come back to after the bad stuff happens. So it's the exact same message about resiliency that we preach, that we share, that we're trying to um, develop new models for. It really is that simple, but of course we all know within our communities, not everybody is going to be able to put that into actual practice. And that's where our work comes in and why I wanted to provide resources to communities, particularly the kind that I had grown up with or in that were very rural, they were country towns, so the country people, um, there were language differences, a lot of different demographics. Um, I wanted to be able to make it easy for people to do what it is they really wanted to do, and that's keep their animals safer during and after disasters. So the Halter Project's website is actually a wealth of information. And when you and I spoke, I'd actually reviewed that website myself and spoke to you about a lot of... No, you, you have very valuable information. And one of the things you brought up, well, several of the things you brought up was you have to have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, and a plan E. At least. At least. Keep going. Just keep and going. it just keeps going because your evacuation route may not be a viable evacuation route at the time of the disaster. While the disaster is happening, everything around you is going to look different. You are not going to recognize your normal landmarks. If you are going to house, if you're going to harden your own home and have defensible space, harden your barn because you might have to take refuge at home. You may not be able to get out. So you want to make sure that not only that you're safe, but your livestock is safe. That's incredibly important. 
your, your, if your home is safe, your animals are going to be safer. And this ties in with what we just talked about. You may evacuate, but OK, so full transparency, I have cats and a mule. So clearly, I am drawn. People are laughing. You know what I'm talking about. So um, it's, it, it's not always going to work the way I think it should or the way I most want it to. In 2017, um, I, I had to put my plan C or D into action. Uh, plan A, the fire was on us before anyone knew there was a fire. The nuns fire started about 300 yards from my back door. Not on my property, I'm happy to say, on a county road. But um, yes, hurricane force winds uh, that were howling. I've been to a lot of trainings, and I said to my husband, gosh, that's that sound that they tell us about in trainings that sounds like a freight train coming at you, or you're inside of a jet engine. And when, when that's happening, and you don't know what's over the hill, but you just know it's bright red and stuff is coming from it down on top of you that's on fire. You know you have to do something fast. I was really lucky and I had some help and I had a plan to turn to in my brain. My muscle memory kicked in. Plan A was out the door, uh, no way to get out. Plan B, nowhere to go. Plan C, um, yeah, we can still get from one point on our ranch to the other, but the barn probably is going to go up in flames. So we went for our earthquake plan, which was some, some place later on in the alphabet. I don't even know where. But we do have a business. We have regular drills. And, we do, and I was an event planner for a long time. And we always would talk about what are you going to do if the shaking starts, if something happens, where do you go? So our safe place was an area on our ranch that is surrounded mostly by vineyard and driveways. So it's pretty safe all the way around. It's a non-flammable building. We got everybody, including the cats and the mule, into that place, all the people checked in, and we did it in about seven minutes. We did it because we had talked about it, we had plans, and we were immediately able to fast forward to that, OK, uh, this plan's not going to work, that plan isn't going to work, so what do we do? We, it just automatically kicked in. We were fortunate, the animals, they were on that plan before I even got there. <laughs> But we know it's not always going to go that way. So again, if we have created safer, more defensible homes for ourselves, our neighborhoods, the wildlands surrounding us, all of the animals, including the wildlife, are going to come out of that a lot better. And that needs to be our goal. So you did touch on your seven minute story, which I think is very important that people understand. You had to basically go to plan Z. So not a wildfire plan, but your earthquake plan. You got everyone evacuated in seven minutes. You had to shout at people. And you, since you actually had everything planned and you were prepared, you were incredibly calm. Your shouting was due to all of the noise. You have engines running. You have that sound of the wind coming, the roaring of the fire going. That calmness, because you had I believe you had to tell your husband, shut up and listen. <laughs> I had to shout at my husband after I threw a wet dish towel on him to wake him up because he was sound asleep in his recliner. Yeah, I told Wendy this story, and she said, you have to share that. It's a great story. <laughs> well, we all have stories, and I have been in those lines at the grocery store. We're, you know, six years later, we're still hearing stories from our neighbors or people we haven't seen in a long time. But yeah, so um, fire was on us. Um, uh, our ranch foreman, who's here today building generators, um, was on a ranch across the street. He could actually see the fire coming more clearly. I knew something was wrong early in the evening, and I had gotten um, my barn cat in, and I had my house cat in, and my other cat I thought was in a safe place. And we brought all the horses down earlier in the day um, so that they were in lower paddocks and pastures where they were um, away from the forested areas and they were um, in a dry area. And if we wanted to move them, i.e. put them in the trailer and take them away somewhere, we could get to them quickly. Um, there were no fires around at that time that we were aware of, but it wasn't, it wasn't right. 
Um, and those of you who've been in those circumstances, and it's many people here know exactly what I'm talking about. So when it started to happen, I tried to wake my husband up. I couldn't. I threw a bunch of additional stuff in my car because my car was already packed with pretty much everything I thought I needed. What I learned later is I didn't have food for myself, so I lived on horse cookies for about 36 hours. They worked. They're probably better than the stale power bars I had. Um, but yeah, we're out on the driveway, the wind is howling, and what we now know was between 80 and 90 miles an hour. We drive um, diesel vehicles, we live on a ranch, so we've got diesel engines running, the wind is howling, the trees are making incredible noise. My husband and my helper are both kind of hard of hearing, and I was shouting, I can be loud! I can be heard over hurricane force winds, I discovered. But my husband turned around and said, stop shouting orders. I, okay, I can't whisper. You don't hear me in normal times. Uh, so I said something like, we'll have that conversation later if we survive this. Fast forward, it was almost a month later, I was tapped by FEMA to um, be a tour guide for um, a FEMA filmmaker. I think he was the acting press secretary at the time. And uh, our, our mission was to find feel-good, positive, preparedness stories for him to film and people for him to interview. So that was kind of an interesting mindset to get into as we're cruising around our blasted out neighborhood. I'm in the back seat of our car and my husband's driving. At some point, I hear him saying to Paul, the videographer, um, yeah, and we were out on the driveway and it was all this firebrands were falling on us. Before that, he never believed me that that was a thing. And he said, yeah, firebrands were coming at us and it was really loud and she was really calm and focused and she told us exactly what to do and she had a plan. And I said, uh, excuse me, at the time, you said, very rudely, stop shouting orders. And he said, well, that was then. So that was, we were close to 40 years of marriage at the time. That was a pivotal moment in our relationship. It's been so much better ever since. So, but yes, was I scared? I was, I was scared shitless. I love being able to say that. We can very seldom use inappropriate language, and so I love it at this conference that we can. Um, I was scared, um, my, my hands were shaking, my voice was probably shaking, but yeah, my brain clicked in, I knew what to do. Um, I already had the cats where I knew I wanted them. I had a lot of stuff, I had my own gear on, um, and I knew where we needed to go, and I knew we needed to do it really, really, really fast. And so less than 30 minutes later, I was able to be a resource for my neighborhood, um, for my community, even with almost no cell phone reception, because we were safe and I could breathe. And so when I talk to groups, especially in our area or others that have experienced the kind of trauma that we've all gone through, I, Jen said it for me and Wendy said it for me, but I want to say it to you, I am not talking to you or to your community, I am walking with you. And so that is why I've worked so hard with, with a very small staff but a lot of mentoring to develop a website, social media resources, but mostly hard copy collateral videos, webinars, podcasts in Spanish and in English that are completely free and available as resources to any individual, club, nonprofit, agency, government, anyone, anywhere who wants help or needs help to help their community, your community, your neighborhood, your agency, your organization, know how to keep the animals safer during and after disasters. And so this year, um, Jen invited me to have a bigger space outside, and so we decided to set up our own little animal disaster resource hub. And it's there for you, and we've got tables and chairs, and I hope that you'll come over tomorrow during lunch, and I'll stay a little bit after, and I'll be here a little bit early the next few days. So you can come and chat, look at the materials that we have, ask me questions, connect with me, 
We're here for you. That's what we do. Our organization is not a nonprofit. We actually um, are self-funded, and we provide micro-grants and all kinds of in-kind support to all of you. So during your fire, you may have been scared shitless, as you said, but you displayed an enormous amount of courage to get everything prepared and done in seven minutes flat. So, you know, take the credit where it's deserved. Um, but lessons learned, when you and I spoke, I just wanna kind of highlight some of the messaging that you had that's also available on your website and available in the resources that you have here. And that is establishing relationships with the agencies that have authority over your animals. Yeah, and I think that actually has already been to a great extent addressed today, just on day one. It is very, very important to start by, you do have to start top down and you have to start, you know, also go from both directions. In the world of animal disaster planning, um, there is definitely a pack mentality and you need to find out who the pack leader is, who the alpha female might be or the alpha male. You need to talk to, start with the agency having the authority or the jurisdiction over animals in your area. Find out what the animal plan for your area, the animal disaster plan looks like. There usually is one, not always. There may be an annex for animals to the county's disaster plan, but you need to start there. Even if there's nothing in place, you need to go to those people and you need to start with them. Don't try to bypass them. And then next, ask them, who are their partners? Who can you network with? We've heard a lot today about the importance of planning, of pre-positioning resources, of having supplies in place, plans in place, um, possibly trained animal responders. You cannot do that if you're working in a vacuum. You're going to need to, even though there's been a lot said about the negatives of top-down management, you are going to have to start there. Don't bypass them or you will get stuck really soon. So networking, 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 finding out who the resources are. And that is actually one of the services that we can provide. We're good at helping you find out and identify what resources already exist in your community. And a lot of times they're there, but people don't know they're there. They don't know how to find them. Which is the important part of the Halter Project is those, you know, you put people together and help them collaborate with the proper resources that they may not know that they need. Because if it's brand new to everybody, they're not going to know what's out there and what's available. So thank you for that. Thank you for the work that you're doing. I think we have some time for some questions if people have them. If you have a question, I can't see you looking into the lights. So just stand up, shout it out. Wendy oh, yeah, can just call you out. If anyone has a question about the Halter Project. Or, or the resources we provide. I know last year at this conference, I was besieged by people during breaks who asked, you know, how can we start a community animal response team? Um, there was nothing in place in our community. Um, how can we prevent that from happening again? And it was, it, we, had, we had some really great successes after the conference in connecting with people, but I know a lot of people left who um, tried to get in touch with us later on which we did. So if, if you think of something afterward, go to our website, subscribe to our mail list. We send out a lot of information that is usually helpful to community leaders. Um, and again, I have a lot of info out there that explains to you the kinds of um, resources, materials, services, and just support. In the world of animal disaster preparedness and response, there are now a lot of people doing it. When I started in 2013, there was very, very little. And now everybody is in it to a certain extent. But that it stops at a certain level. And when it comes to our under-resourced communities, our seniors, our people with language, uh, access and functional needs challenges, they are largely left behind. All of the big agencies now include pet preparedness and even some large animal preparedness in their standard literature. And it's all great. Some information is better than none. 
that it usually goes along the lines of have a plan, build a kit, have emergency supplies, and know how to get emergency alerts. All important, I start there too, but it goes beyond the evacuation plan, beyond the go kit, and it comes back to me, as I said earlier, our biggest challenge and where we can do the greatest good is by helping our communities build safer, be safer, clean up, and in doing so, we're going to create safer, more resilient homes for not just the people, but our animals. And that's really what it's all about, keeping animals and their people together. <laughs>